Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first episode of my fancy new show on Cloud Native TV. This is Cloud Native Classroom. Uh, my plan for these is to go through the CNCF sandbox because there are a ton of projects in the sandbox. I don't know what most of them do. I think most people don't know what most of them do. And I think most of the projects would like people to understand what they do and uh, why they're useful. I am going to be coming at this from like a very, very beginner approach. So if you kind of only barely know what Kubernetes is, or you mostly know what Kubernetes is, but you definitely don't know what any of these like ancillary tools are, this is the one for you. Before we start, I have to say that this is an official CNCF live stream, which means that we are bound by the CNCF code of conduct. This pretty much boils down to be nice to each other, you know, be be decent, don't say anything crude, uh, don't be a jerk, be chill. We can see anything that you type in the Twitch chat, and we also will be responding to it uh, live. So if you've got questions, go ahead and ask. Uh, I am Kat Cosgrove, and today we're going to be talking about Tinkerbell with my friend. I pointed to the wrong side of the screen. <laughs> Jason, Jason, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure thing. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Jason DeTiberis. I'm currently with Equinix Metal, uh, working in the developer relations group there, um, building out a lot of the integrations that we have uh, for uh, different things, including Kubernetes and uh, what we're going to be talking about today, which is the Tinkerbell project. So I'm on the Tinkerbell website and it says uh, provision and manage bare metal anywhere. Uh, what does bare metal provisioning mean? Yeah, so um, folks that are dinosaurs like me might remember that um, in the past, almost everybody had their own little data center. I remember the first job that I had was a small uh, cell phone retailer and we had a, you know, a room in our main headquarters office that hosted the servers for all of our uh, web applications or and our POS system and things like that. Uh, most folks today are probably running those uh, in some type of cloud provider environment. Um, but there are still folks who have need for data centers and running hardware inside of data centers. And uh, the goal behind bare metal provisioning is, is uh, to help pro provide lifecycle management around that hardware infrastructure, similar to what you would have within a um, cloud environment around the uh, virtual instances that you provision there. Okay. So we're we're trying to modernize something that has been around for like, not not really not a literal eternity, but an eternity in like in IT terms. It doesn't feel like it's been that long, but it has absolutely been that long. So Tinkerbell does this how and also like why would you why would you want to do this? Like what what is the use case? Why is this better? Yeah, well, so um I think the biggest thing to say is uh where Tinkerbell came from and uh, the idea was is uh, my current employer, Equinix Metal, um, used to be the cloud provider formerly known as Packet. Um, mm. We provide automated uh, bare metal provisioning for users, uh, similar to what you would have at, at Amazon or Google or something like that, uh, but you actually do with physical infrastructure. And mm -hmm. the idea behind Tinkerbell was to try to take that uh, infrastructure management that we had built out uh, to provide the packet now Equinix Metal Cloud and make that available to other folks. Um, because if you look at like the bare metal provisioning space, a lot really hasn't changed over the past few decades. Um, a lot of the old, a lot of the same projects exist for doing things uh, like um, Pixie booting, which is basically being able to network boot uh, the hardware and, and install an operating system, things like that. Uh, a lot of these projects have been around forever or they're uh, particularly tied to, um, you know, one infrastructure management uh, provider um, and, and things like that. So the idea was is to throw out a project out there that's more generally usable and mm -hmm. uh, enable people to kind of 
pick and choose which bits uh, that they actually need. Um, so, uh, for example, Tinkerbell isn't one real monolithic project. It's not just one binary that you install. There's actually several uh, different microservices that handle uh, different parts of kind of the provisioning lifecycle. And the idea there was is that you can leverage existing infrastructure that you have and only use uh, the components that you care about. And uh, kind of the core of that is uh, the Tinkerbell workflow engine itself. And you know, while the first thing that the Tinkerbell docs say is, you know, bare metal provisioning engine, um, it, it's actually really more general purpose than that. Um, if you look at the core workflow engine, there's a worker component, there's a server component that tells the worker component what to do. Um, you know, in the general use case, yes, you can use it for provisioning infrastructure and putting an operating system on it and deprovisioning it. Uh, but you can also do other things like ad hoc tasks on infrastructure that you have around. Uh, you can kind of power on infrastructure and have it sitting there waiting, ready to install something for you. Um, you can uh, periodically you know, go out and use it to automate installing uh, new BIOS updates on all of your infrastructure systems and, and things like that. It, it's really more, you know, at the core of it, it's really just this idea of, um, having, you know, hardware defined and being able to go off and tell that hardware to do something. Um, so it's a little more it, robust than it sounds on yeah, the first page of the website. Exactly. But at, if we led with that, uh, I think it would cause a lot more confusion because it's like, well, what do I need? Like, you know, this, this workflow environment for, uh, and, you know, you needed to do these complicated tasks like provisioning bare metal infrastructure. And there's some fun things that we can get into about what that enables. Um, but, you know, it really is able to do much more than, than just install an OS, for example. Well, that's, that's rad. I assumed it was just installing an OS. <laughs> so uh, now, now we've all learned something. So there's still like a ton of like legacy applications that are running on like the the old school bare metal that probably want to try to like move into the year of our Lord 2021 and uh, sprinkle some Kubernetes on it. And uh, so Tinkerbell is kind of a way that helps enable doing that, but allows them to keep their old uh, bare metal roots. So there's definitely an aspect of that. Um, there's also an aspect of, you know, why necessarily run a virtualization layer uh, between you your uh, hardware and Kubernetes if you don't yeah. absolutely need to. And, you know, it's always a trade-off. It, it, you know, there's a trade-off whichever way you go. There are some benefits to having that virtualization layer, mm -hmm. um, but there are also some drawbacks to it as well. So, you know, there, there's some really cool things that we can do around automating the infrastructure when you have this grpc based api um, and the ability to find these workflows you can do things like uh, we built a uh, initial proof of concept of a cluster api provider for tinkerbell and that can actually fully automate defining the templates and workflows needed to actually provision the hardware into a kubernetes cluster for you um, but you can also have it running other types of applications as well. Um, the possibilities are almost endless. Um, we, we have these things, uh, you know, each of these workflows uh, can be broken down into uh, distinct actions. And okay. uh, um, one of the things that uh, we did relatively recently was uh, we built out what we're calling an artifact hub, um, and or not mm -hmm. artifact hub, an action hub built on, um, the CNCF uh, artifact repository. Um, and you can actually find some predefined actions that are available to use there. Oh, cool. Um, you know, or you can define your own actions. At, at the end of the day, all of these actions really are, uh, are basically just uh, calling out to a Docker container that exists somewhere and uh, some wrapping around what inputs go into it and what do you get out of the back end of it. So some of the more complicated things are abstracted away for you. You don't have to worry about it. So if I, I'm a very hands-on learner when I'm, when I'm learning something, I can't, I do always read the docs first and I, I love a good documentation. Um, 
everybody pay your technical writers more, please. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do start by reading the docs, but I can't actually learn something unless I like try it. And the the term bare metal sounds uh, scary and it sounds like it involves specialized equipment. Uh, is there any, do I need specialized equipment to like actually try Tinkerbell myself or like, how do yeah. I, how do I do this? How do I, if I wanted to mess with this later today, how do I do that? So currently um, if you go to the documentation, there's a section of the documentation that's called uh, setting up Tinkerbell. And there, there's a couple of different ways to, to go about it. Uh, they're both hosted in a, a repository under the Tinkerbell organization called Sandbox. And, and the idea is, is that um, we take all of the various different components, we test them together at known versions so that you can have that reproducible type of environment. Um, there's one that's based on Vagrant that allows you to basically spin it up on, on a laptop or something like that. Uh, okay. We're working on Kubernetes, automated Kubernetes-based deployment. So if you do have a Kubernetes cluster already and you want to try it out there, you can deploy all the components there. Um, and it, you know, because we are a part of Equinix Metal, we do have a Terraform-based um, deployment that you can use to deploy it to the Equinix Metal environment and be able to use it to automate actual uh, bare metal infrastructure hosted by us uh, with your Tinkerbell instance as well. Okay, cool. Rad, how long does it take somebody to run through that? Like if you were doing it, you know what you're doing. How long would it take you to spin up like the the Vagrant flavor? So as far as the Vagrant flavor, um, it takes a little bit of time just downloading uh, all of the bits off the internet. Sure. Um, you know, but you can get up and going in probably 15 to 20 minutes with uh, with a small environment just with the Vagrant up command. Oh, wow. That's fast, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's quicker than I expected. It takes me longer than that to set up some of my demos for other things. So that's that's pretty that's pretty dope. Yeah. And I mean, if you're trying to do some a little bit more complicated, like set up the uh, demo environment for like the cluster API provider, it takes a little bit longer um, because you have to make some tweaks to things to be able to make sure that the Kubernetes bits can talk to the um, the vagrant bits and things like that. Um, but, you know, the, the whole idea was, is we wanted something that folks can go to stand up in a short amount of time and just start playing around with the system instead of having to like figure out the whole architecture. How do you piece all the individual bits together just to uh, kick the tires with it? So for somebody who has like very a little bit of experience with Kubernetes. Assume we're talking to a student here. A little bit of experience with Kubernetes. They're uh, my age or younger. I'm 31, so they have probably never actually touched a bare metal uh, deployment before. They don't. They barely know what that is. They might not know what it is at all. Uh, where where would you say that somebody should get started learning about uh, bare metal as a concept and Tinkerbell specifically? Is there like are there videos that you like, or is there a particularly good guide somewhere? Um, so I think we put out quite a bit of uh, content on uh, our uh, streaming channels for Equinix Metal, and I can go ahead and get you those links so that we can add those to the notes later. Um, yeah. You know, uh, a, a lot of our folks are doing uh, a lot of good work around uh you know, showing demos, uh, you know, going through the basic content for it and all of that. Um, but really, uh, we're trying to make it possible so that you can actually run this on whatever you have. Uh, Tinkerbell is compatible with both um, x86 and uh, ARM64. So oh, cool. um, I, I know some folks have actually gotten it running with some Raspberry Pis in their environment. You'll need a Pi 4 to be able to do the network booting needed for it. My next um, question was, can I do this on a Pi? I have a bunch of Raspberry <laughs> Pis just laying around and I was going to take a crack at it on that. So, Yeah, but uh, <laughs> like for the demo that I did for uh, KubeCon, I had a few systems that are just small uh, form factor x86 machines that I bought maybe three or four years ago and have just been collecting dust. And I threw that together. Um, obviously, I couldn't automate powering those on and off because they don't have any type of a um, lights out management system. Uh, but as long as I'm happy to, you know, push a power button here or there, 
um, everything works with uh, whatever hardware that you have, or or oh, at least cool. it should. Yeah. Okay, so you don't you don't need a big like beefy Intel NUC or something. Like you you can in theory do this on a Raspberry Pi four. Yeah, there's there's definitely better things that you can do, especially with some of the high end NUCs that do have yeah. um, the management interfaces and things like that. Um, but no, you definitely don't need that. Um, one of the things that uh, we did recently was originally um, the the operating system component that we had that enables the hardware to run um, the worker and be able to run the workflows. Mm -hmm. uh, we called it OC, Operating System Installation Environment. It was about a four gigabyte uh, OS image that you had Ooh. to download. So Spicy. That, exactly. And that also <laughs> meant that you, know, you needed four gigabytes of at least four gigabytes of memory just to run right. uh, the OS image um, to be able to do anything. Uh, we've recently built out a uh, smaller uh, alternative to Ho OC that we call Hook because we're trying to keep with like the Tinkerbell kind of nomenclature. Mm -hmm. And that's actually built using a Linux kit from Docker. And that's enabled us to build um, an OS environment that can run uh, the Tinkerbell worker in under a gig of uh, memory. I think it's about like 400 megs or something like that. Oh, that's um, that's way better than four four gigs. Four gigs is it's a little bit beefy. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, I mean, that, yeah, that's one job. of the interesting things is, is um, when Tinkerbell was originally, you know, uh, put out there, um, the idea was is to take the best practices that we learned building out the Equinix Metal platform, make that available for everybody else. And with that, came some of the, um, for better or worse, uh, legacy uh, that comes along with that. So that OC environment uh, contains a lot of tools uh, and a, a lot of things to enable the things that, the ways that we had done previously. Um, so all of the bits to be able to do BIOS update management and all of the hardware support for all the various things that we need were all pre-compiled uh, into that OS image. And when we started building out this alternative hook, um, we were able to leave a lot of that behind and push the idea that you do more of that uh, with actions or uh, some other mechanism with Tinkerbell. So um, in my opinion, it's a really interesting time because we've gotten beyond the official release of Tinkerbell. And now we're getting to the part where we can figure out, you know, what do other folks outside of Equinix need and, and what are they looking to do with Tinkerbell? How do we enable that? And additionally, how do we improve our internal platform at the same time? And how do we drive, you know, uh, enabling those changes through the Tinkerbell project? Um, so we're, we're currently, you know, looking at the base architecture that we have now and figuring out where to take it next. So even if Tinkerbell doesn't fit your specific use cases now, we're definitely interested in hearing what folks are looking to do with it so that we can, you know, uh, help enable those those use cases as well. Cool. Uh, for the people watching on Twitch, if you have uh, questions, you can throw them in the Twitch chat, and we will we will see them. Uh, we have one question. Uh, let's say I'm interested in contributing code and I want to get into helping. How do you go about helping? There are several repos. It would be nice to know how people with more experience than me kind of get the initial push or some momentum. Uh, let's say as a job, maybe I could ask for someone's time or mentorship. What I've tried so far is cloning the code and trying to run the test and see what they do. You might have more insight, especially as an expert. Thanks. Uh, we are both experts in very different ways. <laughs> so that's a, that's a good question. Contributing is uh, an important thing to do with open source, especially with like with really young projects like like this one. Um, people typically do want outside help. Um, so please do that. But I get it that it is kind of like it's daunting. It's it's a really daunting task. You uh, may feel like you are potentially going to step on somebody's toes or you're embarrassed about the quality of your code, even though you shouldn't be. I'm sure your code is great. Um, it, it can be kind of scary to do that. Um, when I started contributing to open source, I started with documentation changes. Uh, as a newbie, that's that's always something that's that's really really valuable. Like just go through 
a quick start guide for something and anything that doesn't like if you if you can't actually get something to run following the instructions as written make a note where things differed or where things weren't clear enough and then maybe open a pull request with those changes that's how i started but uh specifically with tinkerbell i will leave that to jason yeah i think everybody's path is probably going to be a little bit different um you know we definitely encourage the the docs first approach for for folks who are comfortable with that. Um, I think there are other approaches as well. So we have a um, bi-weekly community meeting that we have, and there's a uh, Google mailing list, and I can dig that up to make sure that that makes it into the show notes as well. Uh, but if you join that, you automatically get an invite to the community meeting. Um, you know, We're more than happy to have folks come there and ask you know, uh, what they can help with. Uh, we also hope that, you know, we have some issues that are on the various repositories, you know, marked uh, in a way that uh, indicates that they're help wanted or potentially good for first users. Um, you know, some folks just want to kick the tires with things and and see how they work. Um, it's perfectly fine just to come in, you know, headfirst with the pull request. Just expect that if you do go that way, that you may get pushback on the approach that you took. And uh, I don't expect anybody on the Tinkerbell project would be um, uh, overly, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, abrasive about it. Um, but, you know, they're generally going to want to have a conversation around, you know, what's the what's the best path forward? Um, and it might not necessarily be your first, uh, you know, first idea when you're when you're starting out with that way. Yeah, and from like a purely like how do you do this perspective, uh, the overwhelming majority of uh, open source projects, and I think all CNCF projects are required to have this. There's a contributing .md. There's like a contributing markdown file that'll go over the actual like required steps and processes involved in contributing to the project. So definitely that is uh, something you should read. But one of the best things about the CNCF, about all of the, the projects in the, the sandbox and incubating is that this this community is really, really, really social and really, really welcoming. And we, we do all just want the best for each other, like personally and professionally and for each other's projects. And that requires us working together well and uplifting each other. Like nobody, nobody at Tinkerbell is gonna be a jerk about the quality of your your pull request uh and nobody in any other project is going to do that either so uh, and if they do you know send them to me and i'll make a stink about it um there are also cncf ambassadors that are always willing to help too but uh tinkerbell is really this was my first choice uh because it is something that is like it's Bare metal is interesting in that it's it's very old and it's still a thing, uh, and it's it's a thing even in like very aggressively modern uh, places like Kubernetes. So I think it's also a super interesting place to start contributing. You you get to dip your toe into some uh, technology that can feel a little bit arcane. You know, uh, it does feel arcane to me, kind of. <laughs> which I mean in like the most loving way possible in like a, a cool fantasy novel kind of way. Well, and it's interesting because if you get down into the the bits of it, um, one of the components boots is the bit that handles uh, DHCP and the uh, pre-boot execu execution environment, pixie booting aspects of Tinkerbell. Um, and if you look in there, there's legacy built into those protocols and, and mm. how do you support uh, different things because uh, different types of uh, Pixie implementations in practice are very different. Um, so you need to be able to support things like a legacy boot P uh, protocol to be able to make sure that you can get the infrastructure up to a bit where you can install um, a common uh, Pixie environment like iPixie to be able to you know, use a common workflow from that point. Um, and, and just the way that, you know, uh, Different things just vary slightly when you're dealing with hardware versus uh, virtual things. But I think the the real interesting thing is is not necessarily what folks are doing in the data center, uh, but what folks are calling the edge right now. And the trying edge, yeah. to actually deploy 
physical infrastructure in remote locations and needing to manage that infrastructure in a way that doesn't require, you know, uh, this particular box be this particular task and pre-installed somewhere remotely and dropped in and, and um, being able to actually do kind of that cloud native management of infrastructure in those remote locations is um, some of the real yeah. interesting things that are happening around bare metal today, I think. So, uh, first of all, could you say hello to your dog for oh, us? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's very cute. Unfortunately, behind my uh, green screen, and he's Aww. located in the office with me today because we have some visitors, and he's he normally has the room of the house, so he's he's a little anxious. A little being, anxious uh, about it. That's okay. Uh, so we have at least one person in the chat who is who's actually a student and has zero uh, experience with bare metal. So you've you've used um, the phrase pixie booting a couple of times. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so basically uh, Pixie is, uh, stands for pre-boot execution environment. And the idea is, is that um, it's a way to sit there and initialize uh, an operation and to be able to boot the system. So you don't necessarily have to, uh, in the old days, you would actually go to a data center, uh, you would plop a CD into the CD-ROM driver, even further back, plop a flop, floppy disk in and install your operating system that way. Uh, Pixie booting is basically a way to uh, boot off of the network using DHCP, get an IP address, uh, get a uh, OS image to basically boot up into to then do whatever you're going to do. It can be install an operating system. Um, there are things like uh, you can create menu systems so you can choose which operating system you want to install. Or uh, in our case for Tinkerbell, it's the uh, bit that just enables it to get into that uh, OC or hook environment and do whatever you tell it to do. Cool, thank you. Uh, we've we've kind of inherited a lot of like uh, like super old terminology over over the decades now of uh, of computing uh, that that sticks around um, because it still you know it still exists, but we've we're so far removed from its origins that sometimes we just like we keep using these words, but. Uh, don't necessarily explain them as well. I'm really bad about that, and it's something I try to like keep an eye on with myself, so I don't I don't use too much um, too much jargon. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's really cool that Tinkerbell is kind of bringing uh, this legacy uh, way of doing things into the modern world because people still want to do bare metal provisioning. Like it, it is absolutely it still has a use case. But it's been uh, something that's kind of fallen out of the limelight over the last decade or so. Um, I remember before, like cloud computing became uh, as ubiquitous as it is now. It was it was still something that I heard about a lot in the data backup industry, but uh, hadn't heard about it um, in about a decade before I heard about Tinkerbell. So, well, and it's interesting because. Coming from you know environments where there has been some type of infrastructure run before, I've been in places where there was no infrastructure management and everybody did everything manually. Yeah. Um, and then you know it generally be, became who's your infrastructure vendor of choice? Use their software to kind of automate some of these things. Or on the open source side, you might have something like Cobbler or some like that that made it somewhat easy to provide pre-configured options for what you want to do uh, at boot time, but mm -hmm. made it a little bit more difficult for, you know, being able to automate some of the infrastructure. And there have been some other projects that have come in and out during the, during the period. I think the thing that really drew me to Tinkerbell, though, was um, the idea that we don't necessarily need to be a monolithic, you know, entity. You don't need to adopt necessarily all of the project to be able to consume it and kind of, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, modernize um, your workflows in a data center, you can hopefully just be able to pick the bits that you need and consume things like the workflow engine and rely on your existing uh, DHCP systems for uh, providing that functionality if, if you want that. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, trying to build out some higher, higher order like cluster API, 
you know, that's very um, appealing because you can tell people, hey, you can make use of this in your environment without necessarily having to rip and replace, you know, all of the existing infrastructure management that you have for everything else in your data center. Yeah, we want a little bit, we want a little bit more control now. And Tinkerbell, it sounds like gives us some extremely uh, fine grained control. We have another question. Do you want to uh, answer this before we go? Do you yeah, have a little bit more not? time? Okay. Uh, I'm still kind of fuzzy on this. So like how I might use AWS or GCP, et cetera, to manage how my application should run. Are we now provisioning the hardware they run on top of? So now I can get my apps out there from home and the person managing the hardware is also at home doing updates. Um, so I don't know if I completely follow uh, but the idea would be is uh, you can manage your infrastructure, you know, your physical infrastructure in a way similar to you would manage that uh, virtual infrastructure at a cloud provider. Um, so, you know, you could do the same things like uh, being able to scale your application to meet whatever type of hardware capacity you have. Obviously, unlike a, uh, you know, most modern cloud providers, you couldn't treat that capacity as nearly infinite from your perspective, you're going to have some type of uh, hard limit, uh, but you could leverage, you know, that scaling capability, or um, you can leverage things like automating your upgrade workflows in a similar way that you could do with uh, that cloud infrastructure, um, things like that. Cool. Well, uh, that is about all the time we have. Um, I really appreciate you coming to teach me about this, this thing that I didn't know anything about and teaching uh, the people watching about this thing that maybe they didn't know anything about. So sounds like Tinkerbell, it's bare metal provisioning, but it's also more than that. It's uh, whatever you want it to be, it sounds like, which is pretty cool. Um, thank you. You have been great. Uh, viewers, you have also been great. Thank you for asking questions. Uh, make sure to follow the channel so that you get a notification when uh, we go live next. There are shows uh, every weekday. Tomorrow is uh, Kaslin Fields running Fields Tested, and she's going to be deploying a personal blog on Kubernetes, which is one of my favorite flavors of demo. I love over-engineering something that should be relatively simple um, and doing something that we're all familiar with. Well, most of us are familiar with like deploying a blog, uh, but doing it with Kubernetes is a, is a good way to teach people, I think. Cause it's, you know, maybe it's over-engineering, but also it is a practical example of how to use a tool to do something familiar. So thanks everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. I will see you personally. Uh, week after next because my show is every other week so make sure you follow us on twitch and if you want to you can also follow us on twitter also at cloud native tv if you want to get a hold of me or jason our twitter handles are on the screen uh i'm kat cosgrove this has been cloud native classroom good night